Well, I think we'll get started um, and do this promptly on time. Welcome, everyone, to this very special event tonight. Um, I'm glad you could all come. I want you to know that when we planned this two months ago, we deliberately picked the night in which uh, it would be the third game of the Cubs versus uh, the Red Sox. Uh, but we figured that as a way of expressing your dedication, As we get the score of the game between the Red Sox and the Cubs tonight, I'll kind of pass it along to you at uh, different points in time. Um, I'm Alan Wolf, and I'm the director of the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College, and it's my honor to introduce Dean Joseph Quinn of the College of Arts and Sciences at Boston College, who's going to introduce our main speaker, uh, and afterwards uh, we'll have a discussion of what our speaker has to say. Dean Quinn, please. Thank you very much, Alan. Steve Goldsmith is a very impressive individual in a number of dimensions. I will try to introduce him briefly, although it will be difficult to do so. He's probably best known for his political career. He was three times elected prosecuting attorney, what we would call district attorney, for Marion County in Indiana, where he served for 12 years. He was then twice elected mayor of Indianapolis, the 12th largest city in the United States, where he served for another eight years, and he was almost elected governor of Indiana. Unfortunately, this wasn't horseshoes, so almost didn't count. He then served as chief domestic policy advisor for the George W. Bush campaign, and now serves as special advisor to the president on faith-based and not-for-profit initiatives. Steve also has a very impressive academic record. He's a professor of public management and chair of the Institute for Government Innovation at the Kennedy School at Harvard. He also taught at Columbia University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Indiana University. And he's the author of two books and editor of a third. The most recent book is called Putting Faith in Neighborhoods, Making Cities Work through grass, Grassroots Citizenship, which was published in 2002. He's also the author of many journal articles and books and edited volumes and many columns and essays, most often in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And third, he has important civic responsibilities, serving on the boards of the National Campaign to Prevent Teenage Pregnancy, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the Center for Civic Innovation at the Manhattan Institute, he was vice chair of the National Commission on Model Drug Laws and is currently chairman of the Corporation for Natu National and Community Service, AmeriCorps. Steve Goldsmith is known as a particularly innovative leader. For his work as prosecuting attorney and as mayor, he's won many awards, including the President's Award from the Council on Urban Economic Development, the Community Service Award from the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, and the Public Official of the Year in 1995 award from Governing Magazine. I'll end with just a couple of quotes about Steve to show you how lucky we are to have him here tonight. From Newsweek, Goldsmith is the intellectual point man on issues Bush really cares about, like charter schools and partnerships between government and faith-based charities to revitalize urban neighborhoods. Wiry and intense, he is a reform-minded conservative who believes that government still has a role, particularly if it paves the, way, paves the way for individual innovation. From the Washington Post, since coming to office, the former prosecutor has shaken up the bureaucracy, the unions, and even some of his own political backers by applying the doctrine that competitive forces can bring economy and improve services to many phases of government. And finally, from Governing Magazine, Steve Goldsmith has earned a national reputation as an advocate of low taxes and limited government. But back home in Indianapolis, he is known for something else, for making a reality a rhetoric of the rhetoric of neighborhood empowerment. I have only two critiques of Steve. One, he's much too young to have done all of this. And secondly, despite a law degree from the University of Michigan, he's not much of a sports fan. 
which may make him the happiest or most clueless man in Boston these days. We're happy to have you here, Steve, and lucky not to have a World Series game to compete with your remarks. Thanks for joining us this evening. It was a, a better introduction than I expected. I've known uh, Joe for a very long time. And uh, um, I, I like it when you have to uh, talk in front of uh, your colleagues and students because you say all those nice things about me. But um, you ended with the fact I was clueless, which seemed to be particularly inappropriate, and began with the fact that I'd lost for governor. In between that, it sounded very flattering, so thank you. Um, it's uh, it's uh, good to be here. Uh, I appreciate the invitation, and Joe has, or Alan, somebody has arrayed uh, the, the number of rebuttal speakers in great numbers to my left, so uh, <laughs> somewhat intimidated by this. Uh, let me just uh, think for a little bit, uh, if I can, about the role of uh, faith organizations and religion in uh, urban uh, re uh, restoration activities. Um, I, uh, as, uh, as the dean mentioned, I was a district attorney for a long time. I did a number of faith-based activities. My first my first true uh, understanding of the importance of faith-based organizations was shortly after I was, uh, actually the week after I was elected mayor, uh, a friend of mine uh, who, with whom I'd worked in urban activities, a six-foot-six African-American pastor, said, you should visit my church first. I've known you the longest. You should visit my church first as mayor. And uh, so I went Sunday morning and uh, it kind of expecting this uh, uh, prayers of appreciation, and instead he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We have the new mayor here. We're all, we're all going to stand up. We're going to hold hands and pray until he agrees to fix the sidewalks in front of the church, right? Now, this is a very effective tactic, actually. I agreed immediately that the uh, sidewalks are fixed uh, rapidly, and uh, I understood the, uh, the power of faith uh, public partnerships. Um, over the, uh, this church of uh, this Reverend Arthur Johnson was in uh, one of the uh, uh, typically neglected uh, urban neighborhoods. Indianapolis is actually about exactly the same size as Boston, uh, has many of the same problems, and um, there were seven communities of eight to 20,000 people each uh, that I had uh, selected where I was going to do everything possible to change the opportunity for folks who lived in those neighborhoods, and, and uh, we went through a, a number of things, invested tens of millions of dollars and, and, and other activities I won't bore you with, and stood back and, and a couple years later and looked around, and, and some of those uh, seven communities were uh, beginning to succeed a little bit, uh, and some weren't. Uh, and um, it, it, it was clear that uh, without government doing its job effectively, those communities and the citizens in them would have no hope or opportunity. But it was also clear that government by itself uh, wasn't going to be able to make the case, that civic involvement, participation, uh, strong sense of values, uh, all were elements of success. And so uh, we began a, uh, an initiative that uh, was eventually entitled the Front Porch uh, uh, Alliance and, and made itself uh, uh, into a kind of national uh, attention uh, through the uh, campaign. And I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, essentially the role of uh, faith-based uh, organizations and uh, even religion itself in producing uh, good outcomes for urban uh, uh, residents. Um, and it seemed to me at the time that uh, government had become both the monopolist of good deeds and really antagonistic to religious organizations. Uh, that it, it wasn't a question of, uh, of uh, at that point, uh, favoring religious organizations. Government had become antagonistic. One, one summer I had decided we were gonna, I was going to use as mayor all my summer uh, youth dollars, the, the federal government gives states to give the mayors money to hire uh, young adults uh, uh, in the summers. And so I decided I was going to put these out into neighborhood organizations, particularly uh, in, encourage faith-based organizations to uh, take on some of these young adults and teach them trade skills and, and help them. So at the end of the summer, the uh, regulatory police descended on me, uh, sent by the state government uh, at the behest of the feds, and said, uh, you violated the terms of your uh, summer job dollars. And I said, well, you know, how do we do that? Nobody even stole the money this year, which was uh, very unusual, actually. And um, they said, no, you allowed some of your partners to allow the young adults who are participating to say a prayer at lunch. 
Now, it was okay for the kids to curse, it was okay for the kids to fight, but we violated the law if they prayed. Now, this, this is not mandatory prayer, this wasn't things that they had to do, but if the organizations allowed the young adults to pray, then they violated the, the regulatory uh, rules. So uh, this seemed obnoxious enough that uh, we uh, launched an effort to see if we could get uh, government to uh, even the playing field with respect to faith-based uh, organizations. Now, uh, when we talk about faith-based initiatives, let me just kind of, um, kind of stake out the ground here for a second. In the you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, Republicans, uh, when they talked about faith-based and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, many thought they were saying, as some of them were, that government should just stop taking care of the poor and that not-for-profits and faith-based organizations should pick up the slack. Uh, and it is true that government was doing a number of, I think, counterproductive things in urban neighborhoods, but it also was terribly naive to believe that the that the cessation of bad things produces good things, right? And uh, just the withdrawal of bad government uh, was, uh, was not going to be enough, and there were not enough resources in the uh, not-for-profit and faith, uh, faith groups. So when we talk about uh, faith-based initiatives, at least for me, and we talk about, when the president talks about compassionate conservatism, uh, we should accept the fact that there is a role for government to play but that the government does not have to, and the government has to fund services like shelter care or health care or food or whatever, but the government doesn't need to be the monopolist on good, all good deeds. So now we look at the uh, responsibilities between the sectors, and you can think about the faith-based initiative in, in a couple different ways. First, um, you can look at it as a new way to deliver products in complex and difficult circumstances. You know, government is a really good hierarchical, hierarchical bureaucracy. But people have really tough problems in urban neighborhoods. Uh, and why is a mom poor? Um, she's poor because she doesn't have a good education. She's poor because she's been the victim of violence. She's poor because the guy's not paying child support. She's poor because she doesn't daycare. She's poor because she can't get uh, transportation. You know, fill in the blank, right? There's 25 more things and probably, you know, a third of them apply to any given family. Well, government has a program for each problem, but no way really to uh, provide uh, sensitive and highly personalized care to that, that person. So, so uh, to me, the faith-based initiative is a way for government to change the delivery mechanism of services that it needs to help people. And so that uh, providing opportunities for church, mosques, and synagogues, and, and faith-related not-for-profits to provide services is, is important. And, and after the uh, other uh, respondents speak, we can talk about some examples of now, the part of the difficulty here is, however, you're using public dollars, so somebody has to be accountable. And how many government contract managers do you want kind of walking through the church's finances, and how do you wall off those dollars? And if you're using public dollars, then, then the, the public official has the right to insist on accountability. Well, how do you measure performance? How do you measure accountability? Um, uh, the skill sets necessary uh, for this sort of sophisticated, subtle contract management on the part of government generally don't exist. Right? So you have either heavy-handed contract monitors who make their way into the church or mosque or synagogue and, 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 and intrude, or you have those who are neglectful and don't hold people accountable, and, and, and that pressure is particularly difficult, and, and, and the definition of performance is, is problematic as well. So that's kind of one area of faith-based initiatives, which is how do you reach out to grassroots groups? How do you allow them to participate? And there are a number of ways to do that. You can do it through a government grant. You can do it through a government voucher. Uh, you can do it through a government tax credit, right? How many of you or your families uh, contribute to your church uh, and take a, a tax deduction or tax credit, uh, depending on the contribution? So there's different ways to do it. But I think more interesting, uh, even uh, for today's conversation, uh, is, is the following. Um, do uh, citizens who uh, affiliate with a religious organization uh, more likely succeed in life, right? Are they more, more often better employed or better educated or more successful? And, and the literature is um, a little bit um, uh, early to answer this question, but when we talk about faith-based initiatives, we can talk about secular initiatives with faith-based boards, right? We can talk about faith-motivated initiatives where lots of folks, because of their church missions, reach out to folks in urban neighborhoods. Or we can talk about faith-filled initiatives, right, where, where the initiative is to take a person that has a problem 
and fill them with faith so that they can succeed in life. Now, though that last category, the faith-filled initiative, is the one that creates the most confusion between government and the faith world. And, and the best example, the most, maybe one of the more written about examples, and this is Teen Challenge, right? Teen Challenge gets young men and women off drugs by a very deep and abiding belief in God. Very fundamental approach in, in Christian beliefs gets folks off of, off of drugs. Um, but uh, state regulators don't like it because many of the folks that are, are out there helping are not licensed uh, uh, masters in social work, right? They don't pass the state uh, certification regulatory uh, regimen, but uh, they're still doing good work. And they're doing it by proselytizing, right? So, so to what extent should government participate in how you draw those lines? Uh, very difficult, but uh, very important. For those of us who, uh, uh, even though the, uh, the empirical research is, is not yet clear, uh, any of us who have, including many of you in the room, walked through one of these uh, activities, a homeless shelter where people are lifted up by their belief in God, uh, a drug uh, therapy organization where people are, be are, are resilient and inoculated uh, against uh, future uh, antisocial activities as a result of their belief in God, you come away uh, uh, struck by the fact this may not be the answer for everyone, but it's the answer certainly for some, and shouldn't they have that option uh, if it indeed makes them better? So, so the, the faith initiative, uh, and we ended up with uh, 600 partnerships with 400 faith-based organizations just in Indianapolis alone. Uh, in little ways, in big ways, um, community part-time pastors creating a kind of oasis of hope in one block of a crack-infested area, or 25 urban churches taking over their uh, neighborhood parks and maintaining them and inviting uh, uh, kids and neighbors uh, in and, and on and on. All, all of those added a little bit to the civic connectedness and, and hope in those communities. But they're all, all these issues, as promising as they are, are fraught with difficulty, right? Uh, what happens when the faith group and the government uh, organization are congruent on certain issues and incongruent on other issues? Uh, we had a session a couple weeks ago uh, over at the Kennedy School where we had uh, uh, six mayors, six faith leaders, and six community leaders. And, a very articulate uh, pastor from uh, Washington, D.C., Pastor Cheryl Sanders, said, you know, sometimes I'm going to help the mayor and sometimes I'm going to oppose the mayor. And um, uh, this is problematic for those of us who are mayors and think we have partnerships with, um, with uh, uh, faith leaders until they exercise their prophetic voice and criticize us, and then it seems somewhat unfair. But she's also saying that, look, um, when, I take in, uh, when I take in residents to my homeless shelter, my goal is not to feed them. My goal is to convert them to faith in Christ and feed them along the way. That's why I'm in business. That's who I am. Now, if that helps the city solve its homeless problems, more, more power to them, but that's why I'm here, right? Well, so she's got a, a very different perspective about her role than the mayor does of her uh, as an outlet for homeless uh, activities, and, and those are substantial issues. Another a very difficult problem is uh, will government money um, uh, corrupt in the non-criminal sense the mission of the, of the faith organizations? I gave a talk uh, right after the president announced his faith-based initiative in Augusta, Georgia, in a church. Uh, and uh, strangely enough, kind of white folks were on the left and, and black folks were on the right. And it wasn't so much, I learned later, because they were segregated. It was because the suburban groups were on the left or, or whatever, and the urban groups were on the right. and and, and um, I gave this talk, and when I was finished, um, most of all of the white residents left, um, and the African-American residents stayed. And I, I, I still had trouble with the dynamic until I read the next day in the New York Times, who also, to my surprise, attended the uh, presentation, and I interviewed the folks who were there. And essentially, the African-American pastors were saying, look, the, the issues in my neighborhood are so difficult, that, and we have so many needs, that we would do almost anything to get more resources. Now, at, at one level, this is a wonderful thing. At another level, almost anything seems like government, through its granting authority, is beginning to uh, encroach upon the uh, ultimate mission of the organization. And, and how do we prevent that from happening is, is to me, one of the most important issues. Um, uh, in addition to these, of course, are First Amendment issues. Uh, it's clear to all of us who have done this that government shouldn't use its authority and shouldn't use its money to force people through the door of a mosque, uh, church, or synagogue. But it's also clear to many of us who have worked in this area that government shouldn't prevent it either. 
But how do you draw those lines? What can you use money for? Can Pastor Cheryl Sanders proselytize if she's taking money for shelter beds? Now, those are complicated issues. But as, as I look back at what we tried to do in Indianapolis, uh, uh, providing encouragement to faith-based providers of services, uh, reaching out to them, solving their problems, helping them uh, secure ownership of the crack house next door or the vacant lot, uh, helping them with, after with computers for their after-school or preschool programs, uh, helping them solve uh, the, the grant mysteries of the federal and state government, uh, created uh, opportunities for the folks who participated. It was a meaningful way for uh, residents to give back. It was an opportunity for those uh, young adults who didn't have a community. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the nexus between faith and community and mentor uh, provided hope for many in those communities that government alone uh, never could have done. So I'm uh, I, uh, even uh, aware of the many problems. I remain a uh, advocate of the lessons that uh, uh, Reverend Arthur Johnson taught me on the first day and, and believe in fact that the power of these partnerships can uh, indeed be uh, significant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor Goldsmith. Uh, we're here to have a discussion of these issues, and as you can see, we've invited three people uh, to discuss them uh, with the mayor and then open it up when they're done. Um, believe it or not, one of the three is not a member of the Society of Jesus, um, <laughs> and that's uh, actually Mark Landy uh, here, who is a professor of political science at, uh, at Boston College and author of a number of books, and including uh, Presidential Greatness, a great book in my opinion, uh, which he wrote in the year 2000 with Sid Milkus. Um, Tom Massaro, Thomas Massaro is, is next to Mark, and uh, Father Massaro is an Associate Professor of Moral Theology at the Western Jesuit School of Theology, um, and has written uh, American Catholic Social Teaching, which he co-edited with Thomas Shannon in 2002, and Living Justice, Catholic Social Thought in Action from the year 2000. Uh, Joseph O'Keefe, uh, Father O'Keefe is the dean, acting dean of the Lynch School of Education at Boston College and has written widely and extensively about contemporary Catholic schools um, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, recently um, or forthcoming uh, a book called Educating Young Adolescents, Conversations in Excellence and another called Sustaining the Legacy urban Catholic elementary schools in the United States. So the procedure is uh, that uh, I think we'll begin uh, with Joe O'Keefe, uh, and then Tom, and then Mark, uh, and they'll uh, say some remarks, and then we'll ask Steve Goldsmith to respond, uh, and then we'll see where we are. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I think you um, certainly raise a topic that is uh, important here, and in some ways, I suppose I was trying to think of the metaphor of your sort of preaching to the choir to a certain extent uh, here at Boston College. I do want to raise a couple of issues that are of concern, however, uh, in the discussion of these faith-based initiatives. Uh, and the first, um, the first is this. When I go to evaluate schools or have students go to evaluate schools, I say it's important to look at the mission statement, but then you also have to look at the budget. Uh, and the budget, in many ways, in dollars, you spell out your priorities. And while I am very sympathetic to much of the talk about faith-based initiatives in the current administration, I am skeptical when I look at the finance issues. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have an urban Catholic teacher corps here uh, where uh, graduates of Boston College and other um, colleges work in urban Catholic schools for two years as teachers. That's an AmeriCorps program, and AmeriCorps funding has been almost eviscerated. Uh, and some of the discussions and, and the reading up on this issue, because of course, um, somehow I have to find the money to pick up the slack uh, for, for these students. But looking at some of the language that seems to me quite contradictory on the one hand, uh, much support for these kinds of faith-based volunteerism, uh, yet on the other hand, seeing in some of, for example, uh, the arguments in the House uh, by the Republicans looking at uh, kind of a skepticism about stipends for people who do this kind of work. 
Uh, one of my fears would be if we eliminate that kind of funding from such public service activities, uh, will such work be only the domain of the independently wealthy? So the whole question of you know, that old show me the money uh, issue, I think, is an important and practical one as I see the current situation of faith-based initiatives. Uh, the second one um, is something that you address certainly, which is uh, use the language about uh, corrupting an organization. I, I like to think of a friend of mine who is principal of a Jewish high school, uh, and as a rabbi said, uh, talking about the voucher debate and addressing the Catholic education community saying, beware because with the shekels come the shackles. And uh, so I guess addressing some of the shackles, again, you mentioned it in, 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 in the language of corrupting the organization. But I think there are very significant issues for religiously affiliated institutions. Now, again, I'm from the world of schools and social service agencies and healthcare providers are quite different in some ways and I don't want to misappropriate uh, issues related to schools elsewhere, but I think nonetheless, uh, it's helpful to see what can happen when there is such uh, government, um, I suppose shackles, to use his language, uh, issues like elimination of preferential hiring for members of the religious organization, uh, elimination of a system to identify and prefer student, uh, students of one's own religious community and missions decisions, uh, forcing the organization to offer services that are contrary to the ethos of the religious organization, uh, the removal of religious symbols, uh, limitations on the teaching of certain tenets of faith. Uh, some of the work that I have done not only is within the U.S., but looking at international issues where faith-based initiatives, for example, in the UK, it's not a secular state officially, and, and there aren't those same kind of problems. Nonetheless, there become uh, these difficult intrusion issues. Uh, within schools, for example, and I suppose vouchers would be the equivalent in some ways of a lot of this faith-based language, um, one of the issues affecting schools and its relation to government is the whole question of academic freedom on a K-12 level. Uh, if you want vouchers in your religious school in Colorado, you must participate in the state-mandated tests with a closely aligned curriculum. Whose history do we teach? Those kinds of issues about the independence of faith-based organizations and how important that independence is, I think, in a free society. Uh, the third point I want to raise, uh, on page 126 of your book, you are, quote, a uh, community leader is, is quoting you saying, uh, find those who are more effective, and if they're running an effective after-school program, I don't care if they are green-eyed Martians. Um, now, I never knew Martians were green-eyed, but, uh, <laughs> but no, the, it raises the issue of the recognition of whose faith are we talking about and what kind of religious communities. And, and when you talk about First Amendment issues, I think it, it, it raises also the question of what is a faith-based organization? What is religion? What are the rules that identify an organization as religion? It's interesting, for example, in a number of charter schools, uh, that were formerly religiously affiliated. So, you know, St. Mary's Charter School becomes the character education charter school. Well, suddenly, because it's not officially a Catholic organization, is it therefore no longer religious if, in fact, much of what happens within the school really hasn't changed significantly at all? Um, reminded of uh, Richard Green, who was once chancellor of New York City Public Schools. I remember he came to Harvard when I was in grad school and talked about uh, the problems of school choice and and again, I tend to be sympathetic in many ways to school choice, even though I have problems with market-based reforms of schools. But in any event, I was saying the problem is endorsement of religious groups. And I explained that I was a Jesuit and that I do study on Catholic schools. And, oh, we're not talking about you, because you, your schools serve the common good. But we're talking about those other problematic religious groups. Um, flattering, I suppose, in some ways, to see Catholic institutions as benevolent, but it does raise the question of government recognition of what is or is not a religion. Again, a number of our European uh, um, countries do that. I mean, officially, there is official recognition of what is a religion and what isn't. So I, I'm certainly, again, very sympathetic to the role of faith-based communities uh, in a range of social service providers, and I think your book was very helpful and talking about the Indianapolis experience and the ways in which that is, Kate, uh, that is so. But uh, clearly, I think when we look at the current reality, the show me the money issue, which I think is very significant and important, uh, the second issue being the shekels and the shackles, and the third issue is the state defining what is religion or what is good or bad religion, and the thicket of issues that are involved there that I think warrant some investigation.
lines of sight are better here. The expansion of charitable choice should be a no-brainer. The adoption of faith-based initiatives should be a slam dunk. I support the idea. Associated with these proposals are numerous advantages. Let me mention three. First, for government, the ability to tap significant sources of energy for the promotion of the common good, and the advantage of fostering deep ties to local communities and to neighborhoods. Second, for churches themselves, and I hasten to add synagogues and mosques and any other religious organizations, the ability to retain their core religious identities while offering their distinctive social contributions more broadly, and the ability to extend the hand of assistance without the awkwardness of setting up separate secular affiliates like Catholic Charities. Third, for potential recipients of such assistance and program participants, the possibility of benefiting from the distinctive warm feel of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor assistance and taking advantage of the proximity and motivating power of faith-based efforts. The leveling of the playing field so that church-based social service programs of all sorts are better able to compete for federal funding has been stalled for all the usual reasons that plague the political process in Washington, D.C. For three years now, those of us eager to witness these reforms have been disappointed as charitable choice has become a political football, a victim of distrust and mutual suspicion that divides the two major political parties. I've had the opportunity myself to breathe in some of this poison atmosphere of the business as usual inside the Beltway, perhaps too much of it. Although I'm a theologian teaching here in the Boston area, I've spent three of the last eight years living and researching in Washington, D.C., mostly on the ethics of American social policy, an area where the contentiousness of national political life is most evident. Intriguingly, the bad news is not quite constant. I've noticed a rhythm of hopeful signs of conciliation, often involving members of Congress going off on retreats into the hills of West Virginia, where they pledge their futures to a bipartisan spirit of cooperation, only to be followed by an eventual renewal of partisan hostilities the very next time significant political points come up for grabs. This might be occasioned by a major appropriations bill, a controversial judicial appointment, or a vote on a symbolic issue like affirmative action or respect for the flag. Whatever the proximate cause, the effect is interminable conflict, puerile name calling, and legislative gridlock. Among those phenomena uh, that prompted E.J. Dion to write his insightful volume, Why Americans Hate Politics. I recommend that book. For this string of disappointments, there are plenty of blame to go around. I apportioned the blame roughly equally to each of the major parties. On the Republican side, I see a party that is tone deaf to a whole bundle of core values that, as Alan Wolf's recent work demonstrates, reside within the American populace. A commitment to equity, tolerance, true concern for the downtrodden, an aversion to militarism, unnecessary foreign adventures, and black and white views of the world. While I'm glad that so many Republican members of Congress support faith-based initiatives, Nevertheless, when I view the entire sweep of their social agenda, I'm left to wonder at the purity of their motivation. As far as the, as far as the executive branch, President Bush's mention of the word crusade in the days just after September 11th takes on for me more significance than a mere slip of the tongue. Rather, it reveals a glimpse of an underlying Manichaean view of the universe that's neither helpful nor accurate. In a parallel way, by invoking phrases like rallying the armies of compassion to describe faith-based initiatives, our commander-in-chief lapses into a military metaphor that's most unfortunate. Um, it raises hackles among those unenthusiastic for it. It needlessly serves to galvanize opposition to an otherwise excellent proposal. Similarly, in identifying Jesus as his favorite philosopher, President Bush blundered badly in a way that poisoned the water for hopes of broader cooperation and faith-based issues. How I wish, for the sake of social harmony in this pluralistic society, that he had named someone like Immanuel Kant, or perhaps in an imagined moment of even greater honesty, Adam Smith. For their part, the Democrats, at least those in Congress, are to be blamed for allowing their approach to faith-based initiatives to be controlled by their fears rather than their, the inherent merits of these proposals. 
Many Democrats have wandered much too far down the jurisprudential spectrum towards a strict separationist position where common sense is, tr is trumped by an obsession about rigid procedural norms that include non-discrimination in hiring practices and program rules. The view of church-state relations expressed in some congressional deliberations on the subject of charitable choice demonstrated an irrational fear of religious encroachment upon public square. Legislation to expand charitable choice was eviscerated by those interpreting the First Amendment as if our constitutional guarantee against religious establishment included freedom from any religious presence in our public life, however benign and service-oriented. A Latin maxim, cited frequently by medieval scholastic philosophers, captures the core of my critique of the drift of recent debates on this issue. An important piece of social wisdom is contained in this phrase, abusus non tolit usum. The possibility of abuse does not obliterate the proper and legitimate use of something, such as faith-based initiatives. In the present case, it's especially comforting that so many safeguards are written into the very proposals, prohibitions against government funds being used for sectarian worship or proselytizing, for instance, and the codified insistence that secular alternatives to faith-based programs must be available to all program participants. In supporting these initiatives, I part ways with most of the political liberals with whom I ordinarily, although not always, make common cause on social policy, especially regarding programs for low-income families. Perhaps I'll be forced to rejoin them and to, and to begin to oppose faith-based initiatives someday. All it would take for me to relinquish my support would be the slightest indication that charitable choice is being used as a fig leaf to cover over further reductions in our national commitment to establishing sound, essential social programs. So, to my sometime allies on the left, I say, stay vigilant. Make noise about any visible signs that faith-based initiatives are being used to replace uh, funding for social programs, rather than merely redirecting it through more effective channels along the contours of civil society, instead of ignoring or even cutting across those contours. I split with you, I say, on this issue because you have allowed your fears to outweigh your hopes on this issue. I'll continue to disagree with you until these fears appear, appear to be justified. To those who already support these proposals, I offer these cautionary words. It would be wise to keep from exaggerating your hopes with overblown rhetoric and grandiose visions. The strength of charitable choice lies in its pragmatism proposing the employ of existing resources to meet urgent needs for an array of social services. The commendable part of your social agenda is not well served by a discourse that features rhetorical flourishes such as opening up the floodgates of compassion and returning to a golden age of private and voluntary assistance. The latter is a myth, one largely created by Marvin Olasky, of a bygone age when low-income families supposedly flourished without government assistance. On the contrary, 19th century poverty was probably much more horrible and even life-threatening than post-New Deal poverty. Indeed, flowery language quite often betrays objectionable parts of a social agenda of the right, the revocation of a social contract that de dates back to the New Deal and features equity and how government interacts with low-income families, including a robust safety net, fairness and tax burdens on wages and benefit packages for those at the bottom rungs of the labor market. Commitment to the social advancement of the poor has not been the strong suit of conservatives in recent years. I can well understand the wariness of many liberals who distrust any social policy initiative that comes from the Republican Party that has been influenced by the frankly punitive messages of pundits like Charles Murray, Lawrence Mead, Robert Rector, and a whole array of right of center think tanks urging the repeal of entitlements and safety net measures. Better to keep the message simple and sober. Let us work together to level the playing field so that religious bodies can compete for government contracts for social service provision. It's far more important to make substantial progress in improving the ways our society assists the poor than supposedly to win an issue with an eye towards the next election. Finally, the tradition of social thought that I follow and teach, that of Catholic social teaching, urges a delicate balance between two key principles. First, subsidiarity, a guideline that recommends local solutions to social problems wherever possible, 
but large-scale or even national measures when necessary. Second, solidarity, which urges us all to take collective responsibility for the unmet needs of the poorest families and the disadvantaged members of our society. Even if the United States, which maintains the stingiest of safety nets among all the ad advanced industrial nations, does not expect does not expand its commitment to its low-income citizens, the demands of social solidarity at least urge us not to restrict further the vital assistance we do provide. Charitable choice loses credibility when it is associated with a diminution of our society-wide commitment to the poor. I will support it as long as it shows me no evidence of being abused in this way. Until then, supporting charitable choice is a no-brainer, a slam dunk. First, I have to correct Alan. I, I actually am a member of the Society of Jesus, because anybody who's taught at Boston College for 28 years becomes, I think, an honorary member of the Society of Jesus. So I, I, I resist being separated from, from my pals over here. Um, on a more serious note, um, since I, I found myself so much in agreement with, uh, with Steve Goldsmith, let me make a few comments, though, about Tom's rejoinder that I think maybe will set some uh, some lines of, of debate uh, uh, for later on. Um, I think we make a terrible mistake about, about George Bush in particular, but about the sort of current, current thr thrust of American politics if we really don't think his favorite philosopher is Jesus, because it really is. His favorite philosopher really is Jesus. He is the most, I think, religiously committed uh, president uh, of the modern era, and you don't have to like his interpretation of Jesus, and you don't, and I, I don't, luckily I'm outside that battle because I'm really a Jew and not a member of the Society of Jesus, so I have no opinion uh, on, his, on his theological views, but, it, but his favorite philosopher is not Adam Smith, it's, it really is Jesus, and he, and I think if you look at the contours of the 2000 voting, you see why it's, it becomes very important to take this notion seriously. Right? I mean, this famous chart of red and blue America really does mean something. All the places where Jesus is taken most seriously and where church attendance is highest voted for Bush. And all the places where it, the church attendance is lowest and people read the New York Times on Sunday morning instead of doing what they should be doing, or the Saturday Times, or the Friday Times, instead of doing what they should be doing, uh, voted for uh, the Democrats. And so there is something very serious about this idea of compassionate conservatism with a strong religious thrust. There's something serious about it, and there's also something extremely political about it uh, at the same time. The, the, the serious side is the notion that there's something better about uh, religious solutions to problems and, and private, on the whole, private voluntary philanthropy motivated by a certain kind of spirituality than secular bureaucratic types of solutions. I think that's quite a serious idea. Uh, and then the, the realpolitik side is also very serious because it's not a very, it's not such an old idea in American politics that the government should accomplish public goals through private organizations. This is not, uh, doing this on a large scale is a relatively new idea that really dates, I think, from the 60s. And the problem, you know, the, the benefits of this are obvious, and we've all we've all cited them. Uh, I think the problems are even broader than they've been stated so far. It's not simply a matter of will religious organizations use their particular access to public funds to force people to walk by altars or uh, mezuzahs or, or what have you. Uh, the issue extends to, to secular organizations as well, because there are very few what you would think of as really secular organizations in public policy, the public policy domain. The non-religious organizations I would call non-religious rather than secular, because most of them have very powerful agendas of, of social change and social transformation, perhaps not Christian or Jewish, but, but very, very deeply held and very powerfully pursued, which means when public money gets spent through non-governmental organizations that are not religious, I would say you have exactly the same problem of worrying about what the 
sort of indirect consequences and hidden agendas are that go along. It, it's not never just about soup kitchens, right? Or, or just about employment training. It's always about employment training in the service of something like uh, Steve's uh, quotation about, I don't really, you know, it's nice if they get trained in employment, but I really want to bring them to Christ. Well, I would say the equivalent is it, it, it's nice if, um, it's nice if they get trained in employment, but I really want to transform them into socially committed people who will bring about major change in the property relations. Right? It's, these are, this is a kind of transcendent problem that I think needs very serious consideration by uh, political organs, and, and I think it's something to worry about. I, I sometimes, might, I might be more than, anyone, more than anyone else on this panel, I might be willing to trade the initiatives and the warm-heartedness of NGO types, secular or religious, for the impersonality, skepticism, and rule-abidingness of bureaucrats. I think this trade-off can, can actually be more difficult, and the more, more price gets paid uh, than we might, we might choose to uh, uh, choose to recognize. And I have to admit, my view is, is informed by the experience of the 1960s, which is when lots and lots of money was given to non-governmental organizations, and very strange things happened uh, to a lot of that money. Uh, the other point that I want to make is less contentious, and it was really very ably said, I think, by all the panel members. I, I really just want to add my voice, which is that I worry terribly not so much of whether recipients are well served by, by these efforts at uh, private uh, pr uh, provision by charity, particularly by religious organizations. I worry a lot more about whether the good of the providers is served. I, I, I do worry about shekels and shackles terribly. Uh, more than shackles, because good, good local people always figure out how to avoid the shackles. I worry about corruption. About, about, uh, about the decay of souls, of wonderful people and who have great spirit and go out and do just transcendently beautiful things, uh, all of a sudden, when the money is on the table, they turn into rent seekers. And, uh, you know, sin is, sin is amongst us. See, I am really a member of the Society of Jesus. Uh, sin is amongst us. And I, I think that unless a great deal of care is, the, uh, is, per, is attended to the question of how private organizations receive these kinds of monies, an, an awful lot of terrible things can happen to them. Um, and along those lines, I, I think that it's, it's indicative that so many of the great examples from Steve's wonderful book come from the city of Indianapolis when he was the mayor. Because I'm much more comfortable with a lot of these very delicate social experiments when they're done under the rubric of local government where there's a lot of knowledge and personal relationship e between providers, uh, churches, local government. The notion of national bureaucracies coming in and throwing a lot of money at this kind of problem uh, makes me quite nervous. Anyway, thanks a lot. I'll just take a minute so we have some time for questions. I, I, I think I heard all the respondents say, open by saying they agreed with me and then spend their time explaining why I was wrong. So I, <laughs> um, let me just, let me make three uh, quick points. One, I think there's a legitimate question about um, how much money uh, is enough, right? How much the government should invest in Medicaid or Medicare or homeless shelters or whatever. And um, I appreciate the point that uh, a faith-based initiative should not make up for uh, government uh, abdication. I don't think that's what the president intends, but, but I think for tonight's forum, uh, I'd rather my position be whatever amount of money you think is enough, it should be uh, delivered through a host of opportunities, including faith-based providers. In other words, faith-based providers should be treated equally. And now we can argue about how much money is enough, but that money will be more effectively delivered if the, if the umbrella of who can participate is, is greater. So I, I, w whether it's uh, AmeriCorps or whatever, I, I acknowledge the point, but uh, also suggest that it doesn't resolve the issue. Um, uh, secondly, um, 
particularly offended that you chose to, to complain about armies of compassion. It was a phrase uh, that was adopted in Indianapolis, Indiana at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, with me next to the president, I was really quite exhilarated by it. Um, um, but let me put it in this context. Um, I, I think it's worth uh, focusing on the fact that a mentor in a child's life, uh, a meaningful neighbor, uh, a community participant, a parish priest who understands the problems of an individual can make a pretty significant impact on their life. And to the extent that government uh, encourages, allows, and even uh, facilitates those relationships uh, is important. And uh, if we can ignite an army of compassion, not as an excuse for government uh, nonfeasance, but as a supplement to government productivity and efficiency, I think that's terribly important. And as we are looking more and more at um, at the effects of, of combining these things, religiosity and mentoring or community involvement, uh, the results are indeed encouraging. Um, third, I, I think the question about what is religion for this purpose is, is very important and very problematic. Um, and um, I want to sidestep it as well uh, by saying the following. I think it is indeed a slippery slope for government to start defining whether you know, the Catholic Church is in and Minister Farrakhan is out. Uh, th those are uh, horrible things for government to do. I'd rather take the position that the First Amendment requires us to be agnostic about faith, right? It requires us to say, look, if you're a not-for-profit or faith provider, you should, come to, you should be able to come to the table just the same as a secular organization or government itself. That is to say, there's a pot of dollars here for domestic shelters or food pantries, and if you are willing to follow the rules and be accountable for the dollars, come to the table. And we, government, shouldn't define which religions, even what religion is, because you can't do that uh, in America with the First Amendment, and, and we shouldn't be doing it anyway. So I acknowledge the fact that these definitional issues are important, uh, in, uh, uh, several years ago when uh, HUD uh, provided money to uh, an organization affiliated with Minister Farrakhan to do uh, security work in Chicago um, public housing, uh, that was uh, uh, viewed as antagonistic to uh, many, particularly American Jews who didn't like his language about um, uh, their religion. Right? So this process uh, of then defining who's in and who's out based on religion is problematic and I don't think should be undertaken uh, at all, similarly as it isn't with, a, with a, uh, a voucher or a tax credit or a contribution to a, a not-for-profit. Um, I, I do think we should probably maybe uh, come back and I'll say in conclusion that the, um, the, the empirical literature is not yet clear. Uh, it does, it seems to me, it's fair to say, show correlations between religiosity and positive outcomes as contrasted to causations. And um, if the church is, has a position on teen pregnancy, and if government believes that uh, teen pregnancy is bad, then we should be able to become uh, partners where our values are congruent uh, to the uh, greater good of our communities. So I remain uh, hopeful that we can uh, weave through these uh, appropriate uh, points of difference raised by the respondents, but still arrive at a, a meaningful relationship. Thank you. Well, let me thank our speaker and our panelists for what I think is an extraordinarily high level of discussion on an enormously contentious but vitally important topic for uh, our democracy. Um, it is, uh, uh, I didn't expect that we would uh, define religion. Uh, uh, I didn't think we would settle the question of what is a good religion that we should all support and what is a bad religion that we should shun or any of these other issues tonight, but I think that uh, we've opened up a discussion that I hope has engaged you, and so I think it's proper uh, and fitting to uh, ask uh, if there are questions from the audience uh, to our speaker or to any of the speakers, um, and uh, uh, we have about a half hour for discussion. Go ahead.
Was that one question? <laughs> um, uh, well, you've, you've asked this kind of group of, of important questions. Um, let me just start for a minute about charitable choice, uh, the existing law that the, uh, President Clinton signed, in fact, and President Bush w wishes to expand. Um, if you take uh, government money, uh, you should not be allowed to turn away those in need on the basis of religion, right? So you, 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 you shouldn't be able to close your doors to others if you wish to take government money. Uh, there is a uh, argument about should you be should Catholic organizations be allowed only to hire Catholics to provide the help. That's a source of, of intense friction between the parties. But there is agreement that if you take the money, that anybody should come should be able to be um, ministered to. The second question is the answer to, your, to kind of one of your other questions in, in, in charitable choice language is that if you take government money. Uh, you can use it for the shelter beds, or you can use it for the food, but you can't use it for the Bibles. In other words, the government money has to be used for public purposes, even by a faith-based organization. The next level of complexity where many people disagree is if you take government money for the beds, can you proselytize at lunch, right? Um, and there's a lot of confusion about this. Um, HUD has recently issued rules saying, in fact, the answer is yes, if the individuals who went there had a choice of a secular provider. So let's say you're in the streets of New York City, you're homeless, if indeed you have a choice between the South, disgruntled, um, choice between a, a faith-based Salvation Army and a, and a city homeless shelter, uh, you, and you go into the Salvation Army, then it's legitimate for the Salvation Army to uh, to require prayer. So I think we need to be very careful about where to draw the limits, but in fact, I think that those limits can be drawn. You had a couple other questions, but I think I've glossed over several of them. Thank you. take more than my fair share of time here. Um, uh, perhaps, is a short answer to your question. Um, certainly, uh, social services um, affiliated with religious organizations could uh, have as a priority helping folks of their own faith. Uh, I don't, certainly Catholic social services has a large and open door to lots of folks in the community. Um, I, th I believe that, though that, and the law requires, that a citizen in need should be allowed uh, choice and not, f if the only homeless shelter is run by the mosque, uh, and that's the only place to go if you're homeless, that's not, a tr that's not consistent with our First Amendment choices. Uh, now this presents problems between rural and urban, obviously, but there need to be choices, options for citizens in my opinion. Um, once you're in the door, if you had an option, uh, your, your questions are kind of complimentary, um, I don't have any problem with the Salvation Army requiring a prayer before lunch, right? Um, but reasonable people can differ on that issue, on the proselytizing once you're inside the shelter. Could I, uh, just two things that might help uh, consider this question. First of all, these aren't all theoretical questions, that there is a track record, there is a history so, for example, if you were to look at Catholic health care, Muslims, Jews, non-Catholics are not um, unwelcomed. Now, there might be certain services that aren't provided because of Catholic moral teaching, um, 
but there are other options. But I, but I think especially in Catholic charities and all, and Salvation Army, certainly uh, a history and a tradition of not discriminating on the part of religion. Uh, the second issue that I think is an important one when you talk about the ability to choose, and sometimes simply having, you know, the fact that there is a secular or non-religious soup kitchen here and the Salvation Army there, and to say, well, isn't it obvious that people can choose? Well, sometimes it's hard to make, for people to make good choices. Uh, that's, that's a lot of the school choice debate, for example. So while it looks like you, know, you can make a rational choice if I don't want to go to a Salvation Army place, I can go someplace else, sometimes those choices are constrained by circumstances too. So I appreciate that point that you're making. But I do think we need to look at the history of a lot of faith-based organizations providing public service in this country too. You economists have convinced me that a dollar is a dollar. You know, I, I do think there's a tremendous amount of sort of uh, chicanery ab about these kinds of questions. You know, so if the money gets spent on the beds, and of course fungible monies would then be available to do uh, for prayer services, uh, it seems to me that it is much more of, of, of a single piece. But again, as long as it's, it doesn't seem to me that that the crux of the problem is, is some terrible fear that some particular organization is going to proselytize, because they all proselytize. And as long as there's enough diversity, I, I think here your protection is diversity. I have to keep standing, because I can't see this side of the room. And it gives me a sense of power and authority, at any rate. So um, uh, I, I, I agree with the answer. Um, as a practical matter, um, uh, actually, despite the fact that I'm an advocate of charitable choice and the right of faith-based organizations to come to the table if they wish, um, I think tax credits, uh, I think vouchers and t tax policy are much more effective because I think that government bureaucrats are, are rarely capable of holding an organization accountable for the money without intruding on the mission. It's very complicated stuff. Um, uh, I, I am chairman of AmeriCorps, um, and uh, we fund sometimes, um, uh, not enough, um, local organizations. Then Congress complains about those organizations misusing the money, and then we send bureaucrats in to kind of shape up the local organizations and we end up with this. So I think that uh, tax uh, credits, tax policies first. Secondly, uh, vouchers are an interesting way to walk around the problem because if you strap the money to the back, so to speak, of the person in need and he or she can pick their domestic violence shelter, um, that feels like a little bit better way to do the matching. But in the end, I think your point's well taken that the religious First Amendment issues are not terribly different among the three choices, but the mechanic, m mechanical issues are substantially different. Can I just add something to that? Uh, I, whenever I participated in one of these discussions, the minute you raise the question of how should government think about giving money to uh, religious organizations, it invariably comes down to tax credits or vouchers because it just seems to escape the Establishment Clause problem of the First Amendment. And if you think about it, that you're giving the money to the individual who's carrying it around rather than to the organization, you don't have to get into this whole question of whether you're establishing a religion. But I think when people say that, they may not fully appreciate what the downside is of attaching it to the individual. Because why do we want religious organizations involved in the first place? It, essentially because there's not a choice essentially because religion is an alternative to the culture of choice in an individualistic free market society. The whole reason for thinking that religion could do it differently is that there's something about religion, it's more something that you're born into, it's something that you live with all your life. 
Uh, and if you think of religion more in market terms, that I'm going to pick that religion today that makes me feel better today and, and switch from one that is making too many demands on me, then religion is becoming more like the rest of the culture and would probably be unable to do the work that you wanted to do. But when you then say, let's empower the individual, by voucher, you're actually furthering the individualist tendencies in religion. You're giving the individual parishioner or the individual congregant the choice of saying, I'm going to take my money to some other organization if this organization doesn't satisfy my needs. And so I, I, can you, either you've got an establishment problem or you've got an individualistic problem. But there's going to be a problem either way, I think. I'll continue to go first, and then the rest of the panelists can correct me. Um, the uh, sh sure, <laughs> um, the, the the more open we are, the more faith-based relationships there will be. Uh, the more entangled you will be, absolutely, for for better and worse, right? Uh, and there will be failures. And there'll be people absconding with the money, and uh, I mean, there'll be all sorts of things. Now, I, to me, I doubt there'll be statistically a higher percentage of failures than there would be if, through the way government generally handles its money, but, but they may be a higher profile. Um, so, um, the, and I also agree with the earlier speakers that I, I kind of like the idea of subsidiarity, which you tend to make better decisions if you're a mayor trying to do this than if you're, it's difficult for a president or a congress to do it. Uh, but um, I gave a, uh, two quick anecdotes. I, when I first started on this subject some many years ago, uh, sitting next to me was the mayor of, of uh, Milwaukee, John Norquist, and I finished speaking and everybody got mad at me. It was before this was kind of fashionable, and John stood up and said, you know, there are a number of things much more dangerous to urban kids in my city than religion. Right. So, yeah, you are entangled, but there are also some positive, positive features of it as, as well. And so I think the, the entanglements are probably worth, worth the result. One issue, too, it gets back to the history question. I mean, inherent in your question, the way you phrased it was, if we get faith-based initiatives, what will happen? I mean, faith-based initiatives weren't invented in 2003. There have been faith-based initiatives in this country since the founding of the Republic. Um, and so I think it does become, in a sense, looking at particular cases, and maybe that's where the local uh, situation, the subsidiarity thing that we're talking about, really does become important. And there's a lot of safeguards already in place. Uh, look at the legal, the jurisprudential history of the First Amendment and the interpretation. Uh, the Lemon Kurtzman, the 1971 Supreme Court case, is extremely uh, you know, careful about how these things are going to play out pervasively sectarian purposes. And I would just say that I'm less worried about that than I am about government trying to ignore the existence of religion, which would be a disaster.
one thing I'd say is simply, these funds are, are going to run social service programs. You can't, just can't submit a request to government to help pay my rent. I'm the Baptist Church on 12th Street. You've got to have a program, and there's a paper trail, and I'm no expert in bureaucracy, but you've got to draw the lines and say, this is what that money went for. It went for this and that and that. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, other people might. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the inherent problem has, has been with us for really quite a long time of, of public monies going to private organizations for specified purposes when it's really very hard, it's very hard to say in addition to some fairly clear performance measures how, those, how that money was really being spent and did the, you know, was the, uh, did the, did the Planned Parenthood uh, counselor who got money only to do something, uh, say, uh, related to something uh, broadly accepted like uh, uh, pregnancy, uh, nutritional counseling. Did, did she also talk about the virtues of uh, um, uh, using contraceptives? Right? How, how are you going to know? I mean, at some point, your greatest protection is not in, 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 in cores of bureaucrats going over, looking over the shoulder of every of every private provider, it's having a lot of, uh, of, of diversity in the forms of provision. Uh, but I think there's a very deep problem, broadly speaking, in so much public business being done privately. It, it worries me. Well, can I just, on the definition question, it's something the Supreme Court's been reluctant to take on, but it did take it on in one significant case, and that was a case of what would make someone a legitimate conscientious objector. During the Vietnam War, the law read that you could be a conscientious objector if you had religious reasons for it, and uh, the Supreme Court was therefore called upon to say whether or not a particular individual's reasons for not serving in Vietnam and for claiming the conscientious objector status was due to religion or not. And this was a liberal court, and it adopted an enormously liberal definition of religion. Uh, by the court's reasoning, you didn't have to necessarily believe in God. You didn't, a supreme being wasn't essential. You just needed some higher moral purpose. Immanuel Kant would certainly have sufficed. Um, and uh, uh, now you might say that in, we're, we have a more conservative era now and a more conservative court. And um, if someone were to challenge the grant of money on the grounds that the money is being given to an organization which is not faith-based and therefore government will have to decide what a faith-based organization is and which one isn't, it will inevitably go to the courts. And it, I think the courts will be driven by a logic to be very liberal in their definition because the alternative is to, is to exclude people. In Germany, Scientology is by law not considered a religion. It's simply the Germans will say it's not a religion, it's a sect. I would be very, very hard pressed to think of any court in the United States that would then start saying that Scientology or Christian science or, or any one of a number of other religions is not a religion, but then you're going to wind up sort of in the big humanistic thing. I think Tom's earlier point is really still the, the, the best response, which is that you can have performance measures, right? How many soup, soup bowls got served at lunch? how much nutrition was provided. And then you have certain, the protections of the criminal code. Was anybody harassed, right? Was anybody made to, 
to do something that they didn't want to do. And, and, and that that's where your serious protections come from. And it's best to, to avoid the, 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 the metaphysics as much as possible because you're not going to get anywhere. There's a huge distinction. I mean, um, the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, describe how small it is, Steve. I mean, it's just this a small initiative. Uh, some of the thing is it's just how the office has three or four people. And the departments now, as I understand them, Health and Human Services, Justice Department, have these little working groups that are trying to put these into place. Uh, I'm completely against the Bush social agenda, except for this office, and I think I made that clear to Steve uh, earlier, and I'm wondering whether he'll drive back with me to Cambridge. I drove him over, and he may want to take a cab back. Uh, no, I think that yeah. we, can, we can agree to disagree on this. I'm awfully worried, though, about just what you said. The, um, the use of block grants as a mechanism, to me, and it's, it's, it's an excuse to shrink the social safety net and to have different groups of poor people, those who need housing, those who need food, food stamps, etc., to be competing against each other. So those are the kinds of things I see when I look at the Bush social agenda, and it makes me worried. I, th I, I heard in your question some worry, too. But I can separate it in my mind from this mechanism of distributing existing funds, and I'm willing to work with people that I normally wouldn't work with to make this happen. Take that one. <laughs> All right. So I'm still worried about Tom saying uh, what, what, what uh, he was willing to agree with me on this one small issue. Or uh, um, well, well, you've uh, several ways to respond to your question. I mean, it's interesting because the faith-based issue has been attacked as nothing new, and it's been attacked as too radical, right? So, it, so, so, so that's a little bit uh, confusing. In fact. Uh, I'm sure some of the panelists know, but Catholic Social Services is a majority government money today, right? So, and that's not new, uh, and it's, a, it's been, uh, I think most believe, an effective way to help an awful lot of folks through the uh, uh, philanthropy and, and good deeds of the church and combination with government money. Um, I, I think that much of the debate has been counterproductive because of, of early claims of success by small faith-based initiatives without rigorous empirical research. And there is a, a lot of research going on now uh, that will, uh, funded by Pew and others that will come out in the next year to 18 months that will begin to answer some of those issues. It's also very problematic because there's not really a definition even of what a faith-based initiative is. Is it faith-filled? Is it you know, faith on the board? Um, so that'll be a problem as well. But in the end, um, I guess where, um, where I would disagree 
is it's not clear to me that we have uniform efficacy in secular delivery systems, right? I don't, I don't in a in a post uh, in, in the time period that since we've ended welfare as we know it. This kind of goes to your work question. Uh, the issues that um, urban residents face are very difficult, and I don't think we have quite the right answer about what the delivery system should be. So I'm willing to agree with you that it's not. We don't know what the answer is but disagree with you that it's been effective up till now and we ought to continue to allow anybody to come to the table who can meet the requirements of the government proposal for what the good should be and, and then evaluate them. I'm just, I'm, I'll just confine myself to the interest group issue. I, I think it's, it's an important sort of piece of political realism that we should all adopt that there will always be interest groups because there are always interests. And so there are powerful interest groups opposing faith-based initiative in no small measure because it's going to gore, gore their ox. The United American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, the, the, public, the school principals, every, every element of, of public provision of education opposes the voucher system pretty much. And every element, the uh, AFSCME, the, the, many of the public employee unions will oppose the, the, fa the faith-based initiatives if, they, if it affects their workers. Now, on the other side, if money, these monies start getting distributed more, strong interest groups will form around that as well. So you can't, you can't be for or against the proposal because you think the interest groups are there, because the interest groups will always be there on, on, on both sides. Just can't be for or against the proposal because you think the interest groups are there, because the interest groups will always be there on, on, on both sides. Just, uh, we're running out of time, just real quickly. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of confusion. Uh, your last part of your question is helpful because there's a little bit of confusion around the following. There is no money for faith-based initiatives. There is no pot of money for which only religious organizations can apply. They did. They, they, right, they did, and generally when they allow those applications, it's faith-based or community-based. The only point I was trying to make was that you were right in your, in, in your uh, kind of last question comment that if there is a, a series of uh, requirements that an organization has to meet to apply for the government money and they are the same requirements regardless of whether you're a faith-based organization or a secular organization then many of these issues are mitigated or go away and and so there is no the only reason, so, so there is no pot of money for faith-based organizations. Because if, if there were a pot of money for only for faith-based organizations, then we'd have to define what a faith-based organization is, and we can't do that, right? So the, the goal of the federal government is to remove the barriers for little guys and faith folks to apply. Having said all of that, I think your first question is particularly fascinating because for those of us who are mayors, Right? The First Amendment issues are really important, but almost never practically applicable. Right? It's, we have many more problems of how to feed somebody who's poor, 
or how to get them out of the winter off the, uh, off the doorstep than we do about uh, fighting First Amendment issues. I'm not saying they're unimportant, but they just are not very prevalent. And so and, but at the congressional level, employment discrimination, and First Amendment, those are the issues because they're large symbolic issues. But I think we would do much better to kind of drop back to the local level and just do pragmatic things and, that, and, and hold people accountable if they use government money. And I think many of the problems would be uh, ameliorated. No, it's, I think it's a great question to close on it, not only because it's a good question, because it gives me the last word, right? Because um, uh, yeah, I want to make this really clear. I, um, I, I'm, I'm essentially a pragmatist. And, uh, I, and all of us who are in urban areas see problems greater than our resources. And I think it would be a, a mistake to say that all faith-based organizations are better than all government or better than all secular organizations. There are really, Big Brothers does wonderful work, right? Uh, and they do mentoring work. And there are also Christian churches that do mentoring work. And some of the faith-based organizations are gonna be better and some are gonna be worse. Um, and I uh, agree, understand your point, And I would kind of drop back to the following, that we ought to have a broad enough uh, tent with clear enough rules that people doing good deeds and who meet the definition of fulfilling a government good can come to the table. And we shouldn't express preferences for faith-based organizations or discriminate against them. And we ought to begin to learn the lessons of where those things work. Thank you very much. Well, I must say you've been a great audience. These are some of the best questions I've ever heard from an audience and some of the best uh, perspectives on, on, on this issue. It's been a terrific evening. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you all for showing up. It's been a pleasure.